cut his face. <laughs> Even his wife, I'm, I'm sure you were. You were <laughs> when I listened on the internet to that testimony, I thought, what other ways could a man make impact than just allow God to use you to make impact in other people's lives. I mean, that song now has been written, how many, close to, how many years now? 20, 23 years. 23 years ago. And it's still making impact. I mean, there was a video I saw before now when a guy was dancing to that song in church. He was somersaulting. He was, I mean, I could I wish I knew the guy to ask, what actually happened in your life? What actually happened? Because the way he was, he was in the Thanksgiving service in church. He somersaulted, to, I mean, then rolled back, and then on the floor doing some kind of, you know, galloping. I said, what happened in the life of this guy? He must be contagious. But you see, the, the hallmark of that testimony is that, please, when they change the, the wordings of that song, that when success comes my, my way, don't join them. Sing the original, because that is counterfeit. Sing the original. The original is that regardless of what happens to you, good or bad, you praise God. Amen. And I just want us to thank God for the awesome joy. In the same way, God has something inside of you that he wants to use to bless the whole of the universe. Just as you release yourself to God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's appreciate Pastor Wally once again <laughs> to the glory of God. Amen. And that takes me, that leads me to the message of today, which is the second part of the message we started off last week. Born to glow. Born to glow. We, we listened to the first, um, v the first one of it last week. And last week, we actually made a reference to the book of Isaiah chapter 60 verse 2, which says to us that gross darkness like night now covers the nations of the earth. But we're also so thankful that the darkness is going away. Hallelujah. We are beginning to see some level of normalcy and things are beginning to come back to us because we are seeing God helping us to overcome this terrible virus that had held us to ransom over a period of time. The darkness that we're talking about is evident and is strengthened when you look at some of the things that we experience on a daily basis. What are the things that you notice? We notice that hardly do we see functional prayer or prayer gathering these days in churches. We see gatherings where people talk about prayer. But hardly do we see people really come together and pray functionally asking God that God Unless you move for us, we will not leave you. Like Jacob did. Like Jabez did. Jabez entered his room, locked the door, and fling the keys away and say, I will not leave this room unless you change my destiny. I'm prepared to die in this room. How much time or how many times have we seen prayer meetings like that? In our days, expectations <clears throat> and hope for answered prayers is in all time low now in our generation. People pray, and at least those who pray, but people pray as a matter of religiosity. Say, well, let me just pray anyway. So I didn't say I won't, I didn't pray. But when you pray and you have that confidence that because I have mentioned it to God, he's going to move on my behalf. God has no choice. 
we see the presence of God missing in the assembly of saints. When you go to church, do you actually see the presence of God anymore in churches where people are gathered? The power of God no more manifests the way it used to be. In Chronicles, we read, uh, we, we read about how priests gathered in the presence of God and they were worshipping and they were so worshipping that the priest found it hard to give a message. Why? Well, the presence of God was significantly so seen. And I've heard even in our days, there was a, there was a remarkable testimony that was shared in those days by our pastor, Pastor Tony Rappel, who said there was a day they prayed so much, a cloud descended and you see the cloud visibly in the, in the, in the temple. A visible cloud. And I showed this to you a while back when I went to a conference in France. I just felt like going. It was like a retreat of pastors from all over the continent. I went to this conference in France and the worship in that conference was so tangible, we saw a flame of fire captured in the picture. Remember I showed that, that to you? I still have the picture. A flame of fire appeared in the room, captured in the picture. I showed it to you. There is a level of God that we need to press into that can convince us that God is real. That is what the world needs. Those are the days now that we need to press into God, not just because we want to make another list appear to God to say, now this is my shopping list for this week. No, 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 no. We want to say, God, if you can express yourself through anybody, in this planet, let that person be me. And God is looking for such people. The word of God, when is it that we will see the word of God being presented with authority and with the anointing that backs it up? You know, the difference between English grammar and the word in the Bible there is a mile of difference. You can, read this, you can write the same letters in a passage and just read it. It doesn't make anything. If you read the word of God that is backed up with the power and the anointing of God, that is loaded with the presence and the, and the personality of God. You know, the word of a man is nothing more than the man himself. Thank you very much. The man himself is his word. That's why people will say, I give you my word. When somebody says, I give you my word, that means, take what I've said to you, take it to the bank. When you take it to the bank, it will be, you will be honored. How many people tell you today that take my word and they have not even turned back before they changed? By the way, what, what did I say? Did I say that? <laughs> We now need to see our churches in our church services no more a predictable agenda of things. You know, actually, and, and this is some of, one of the things that for me uh, as a pastor, I find very challenging. Because the God we serve is not a predictable God. And I know some of you I've, I've checked before with some people. Why do you come to church late? Say, um, I just didn't. I just didn't really feel anything that happens before eleven. Don't really shocks me, you know. So if I get to church around that five minutes to eleven, just by eleven I will fit in. I will just get what I need. That's because the church is not predictable. When you go into the presence of God, anything can happen. Somebody say anything can happen. 
I mean, there's nothing about us saying that we get to church one Sunday and the first thing we're going to do is hear the word and then we worship later. But everything is not predictable. Mm. I know past, pastor will be getting ready to go and preach. It's, it's, it's five minutes to, it's, oh, it's 20 past 10. He should be getting ready now. Everything is mechanical. But God is saying to us, draw close so I can show you a different side of me. But I know that in all these things that we're talking about, and there's many more that I can talk about, God's mercy is calling the church back that we will arise in this time, that we will return, shine the light of God so that we can see his glory again. Somebody say amen. amen. God is calling us by his mercy to come back so that we can see his glory if we want to glow. We cannot glow if we fail to return to the light. The light is our source of glory. And if we must glow, we must return to the source of that glory. The most profound example about this is, is what we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Genesis 1 1 to 3. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse 3 says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Amen. Amen. God declared, let there be light to show that the darkness that was evidence is as a result of the absence of light. Wherever there is darkness, listen to me and listen carefully. Wherever there is darkness, you see chaos. Wherever there is darkness, you see emptiness, you see void, you see waste, you see meaninglessness. When something, everything doesn't have meaning. And that's why the devil likes to operate in darkness. Operate in darkness so he can bring fear. Fear is a gateway to chaos. You know, one of the things that happens when you see people who are fearful is that anything happening to them is not what eventually brings their doom. It's the fear of what is happening to them. Sometimes I see some people pray. And they pray in fear. Oh, oh, oh God, if you could just show up now. Oh, hey, hey. God, no, 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 no. Don't let fear overtake you. The Bible says God appeared on the scene. He saw darkness, gross darkness. He saw the chaos. He saw how everything was meaningless, void. He didn't get afraid. He didn't get into panic. He looked at things with a smile, I believe. And he said, let there be light. He declared with the oral of authority. Wherever you see all those things, you, the last thing that must come to your mind should never be fear. Fear is a gateway to chaos, to emptiness, to void, and to all the waste that you see. Rather than fear, God showed us what to do. Bring light into the equation. That is all you need to do. Introduce light into the situation. Have you heard some people talk, talk to themselves and say, um, uh, Mr... 
Mr. Abiodun, can you please shed more light on what you're saying? What are they saying? They're saying, there is a bit of light, but I'm not yet clear. There's still some darkness. If you can shed more light on it, I'll be clearer. Light is open door. Light gives access. Light is a doorway to solutions. God brought light in the beginning. He created us and expects us to give light to our world as his representatives. That's why I declare to you that you were born to glow. And to glow there is to give light to our world. No, you're not just born to walk through this earth as though somebody without impact. God forbid. After you are long gone, the world will remember that you passed by. I remember those days when we were living in universities and secondary schools. Those of us who went to boarding house, well, some, some decision too, but that was the fun of our lives. We go to places that we knew were fun of and we would write our names there. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't tell you what my name was. I would write, dash, 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 I was here. How many of you did that? Oh, yes. You wrote it there that in decades to come, when people pass by, they'll be asking, who is this person? I can never forget one day in church, at our parent church, in front of hundreds of people. We are just finished, we are just finished preaching. And then one guy walked up to me near the altar, and he called me that my name. <laughs> he said, you. You are the one that just finished preaching. Ah, the world is changing. Because I was far away from what looks like anybody that will preach. What we are saying is that if we get to understand what God wants to do, we are his representatives here on earth. And we must do what he would have done. The question you and I need to ask ourselves, whenever we see darkness... And all the things that are hidden in the darkness is what would God do? What would God do? Remember that campaign a few years ago? WWJD. What will Jesus do? That was in the 90s, isn't it? Yeah. 2000? Yeah. What will Jesus do? In your own case, ask, what will God do seeing that darkness? Seeing that need in your community. Seeing that need in the person sitting down beside you. Seeing that need in the states. What will God do? And if you can give yourself an answer of what God will do, then that is what you are supposed to do. I've come to remind you, that you were born to glow. Hence, what I will say to you is, do what he would have done. Do what God would do. Because you are here. That's why Jesus said, I'm going away. He would have loved to stay here. The disciples would love to keep, keep him here. But he says, I'm going away. Why? Because I know you'll be here. He knows that I will be here. You know, in law, for those of us who know a bit of law, there's a terminology called legal standing. When you have a legal standing or a legal ground to make a claim or citation of a precedence, either of the two, you can interchange all those terminologies. What that says is that if there is anything that you can say was done before, had been done before, 
You can demand that it should be done again based on the citation that it was allowed before. Are you getting me? All over the Bible, we see men and women who had glowed for God. They glowed in their generation. The Moses, the Abraham, the Joseph, the Caleb, the Ezra, the Deborah, the Esthers. Oh, Sister Rhoda, she glowed. When all the disciples were praying and they were praying they were, and didn't even believe what they were praying. They were praying. The whole place was shaking. But when Rhoda said, ah, Peter has come back. I can see him at the gate. They said, you are crazy. Peter that is in the prison. Why are you praying? What if you know that he will remain in prison? The only reason you must pray is because you are expecting an answer. If you don't expect an answer, don't pray. Shut up your mouth. The moment you open your mouth to say, God, I ask of you to change this situation. You must have the mind that God is a God of integrity. If you invite him to a situation, the Bible says, before you call, I've already answered while you are yet asking, said, I have done what you asked me to do. That is prayer. We see the Pauls and the many others. If you read Romans 2, verse 11, it says, God doesn't have favoritism, He doesn't do it. If He did it for Sister Rhoda, can do it for you. If he did it in the life of Deborah, he can do it for you. If he looked at Joseph and allowed Joseph to thrive and be promoted overnight that much, oh, he can do so much in your life, in my life. God does not show favoritism anywhere. Even though you want to drag him into it, say, no, all I respect is my word. If you can put my word into the equation, I can function there. I want to read a fascinating scripture I came across in Ephesians as I round up this message. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 1. I read verse 1, verse 2, and verse 8 and 9. It says... Imitate God. Somebody say, imitate God. This was Apostle Paul. I'm sure he was talking from his experience. He's saying that if you want to make impact with your life in God, he said, I've got a recipe for you. See, the first thing is, imitate God, therefore. In everything you do, because you are his dear children. You know, there's a saying in my language that says, the son of a lion, or the cub, is a lion in itself. If you see a lion that gives birth to a goat, that is demonic. Demonic. If snakes have children, those children must be snakes. That is how it is. So it says, imitate God therefore in everything you do because you are his dear children. You are sons and daughters of God. Do not reflect any contrary. Anything you don't see your father do, don't do it. In fact, you cannot afford to do it. Whatever God doesn't do, you can't do it. If you do it, you're saying to everybody around you that I'm not a child of God. It's not what you profess. It's what you do. For, for example, the Bible says God doesn't lie. He said God cannot lie. 
So if you enjoy lie, then you can't be a child of God. Now, what am I saying? I'm not saying that when everybody doesn't lie. You know, lie has grades or shades. I mean, when you see, when you hear black lie, black lie, you know that this one is lie. <laughs> the president of Nigeria one time ago, we went to see him, myself, Toy, and a few people we were invited to come and see him. And we had, in fact, we actually stayed in his house for about three days. And he, in the morning one day, he would just sit us down and then we would eat, he would serve us. And that day, I asked him, I said, sir, what was the most challenging times when you were in government as the head of state? What was the most challenging thing for you? He said, my pastor, that's how he said, my pastor, I have many, but let me tell you one, because it occurs a lot of times. He said, what amuses me most and challenged me most was when people come to you and they are lying to you and they know that you know that they are lying and they are saying lying into your face and they'll be saying, mm. they'll say true to God and they know you are lying. I mean, they know, they, they know you know that they are lying. And they will still be saying it to you, be looking at you in your face like this. And they will be lying. Say, whenever he sees that, ah, he just keeps quiet and say, this one, there's a demon inside them. And that's how life has been. What we are saying is that God must be your hallmark. Jesus said, I never do anything except what I see my father do. Verse 2 says, live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Verse 8 says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from God. So live as people of light. For this light, that is this light that we now have that is in us, that is within you, produces only what is good, right, and true. Classical scripture. Awesome scripture. I mean, packaged and loaded. I read the same scripture in the Amplified. You know, Amplified Bible amplifies it. Sometimes you need to amplify what you read. It says, therefore, become imitators of God. Listen to me. To be a Christian... Anything you want to do as a Christian, it doesn't come automatically. Practice it until you become perfect in it. You know, if you have a gift of healing, you don't just raise the dead one day. You have to be trying it. And then one day you just find out, wow, headache goes, tummy ache goes, bone healed. And then one day, dead body come back to life. Wow, that is how it happens. Tony and I saw one video yesterday about how a leg grew. Grew. The, the girl's leg was like this. And on camera, the man prayed for and the leg grew. On camera. We're saying that you can practice it. It says, be imitators of God. Imitate God. You know when we imitate ourselves? There are some things that I would do. And I mean, some of you have, have seen where you say, this is how Pastor Tony preaches. This is how he talks. This is how he does things. Yes, that's me. And I know the way you two do your own thing. I know the way you dance. I know the way you walk. Is it because I've not shown you? Some of you, if I imitate you, you almost... F Come and see how my, myself and Tony, we have fun. In our room, just to the two of us. If everything is boring, we are never bored. 
We will begin to just share, you know, imitate this person, talk the way this person talks, you know, do laugh the way this person laughs. We just enjoy ourselves. After all, we are husband and wife. What concerns you? Nobody knows. <laughs> sometimes we even imitate our children. And we know sometimes they also imitate us. That's the fun of life. Say, imitate God. Copy him. If you copy God enough, you'll be like God. You see, and follow his examples. As well beloved children imitate their fathers and mothers. Imitate God like well beloved children imitate their fathers, I added, and their mothers. Because the Bible says, older women teach the younger ones. Isn't it? Yes. You see, and work continually in love. That is, value one another. Practice empathy and compassion. Unselfishly seeking the best of others. You know, selfishness is a disease. To be selfish is a disease. It's not an attitude, though. It's a disease. If you are selfish, it can eat your every part of you dry and kill you. You are supposed to be kind. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for you, an offering and sacrifice to God, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Live as those who are native born of the light. Native born of the light. For the fruit, that is, the effect, the result of light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Let it be shown in you. If you if anybody presses you, what must come out of you must be the love of God. What must come out of you must be the nature of the God that we serve. One of the greatest secrets the devil doesn't want you and I to know is that your light is the answer to the darkness of this world. He doesn't want you to know that fact. Your light, the light inside of you, the light inside of me is the solution, is the answer to the darkness of this world. And you see that in John 1 verse 5. It says, the light shines in darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. My light is the solution of the darkness around me. Anywhere I go, I need to glow and let the world see that there's a light coming. You were born to glow. Give your light every day and everywhere you go. Do not subscribe to the Sunday, Sunday Christian agenda. You are only Christian on Sunday. You know, there are people. Did you use it? Never do that. Neither should you agree to the temple Christian syndrome. The temple Christian syndrome is once you enter the church, you just become sanctimonious. You walk nicely, you talk gentle, you wave, you don't, you know, you, you, you are just, you comport yourself. But once you get onto the highway near the traffic light, ah, that is your, <laughs> and there's nobody here. If you give me, I give you back. No, 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 no. God wants you to be his child, his children. Everywhere and every day of our lives. Shout hallelujah to that. Hallelujah. At work, you must be that giver of light. God wants us to glow. Luke 8, 16. Say, no one light a lamp and cover it with a bowl and hid it under the bed. A lamp is placed on the stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. 
People don't want to stumble. And you're supposed to be the one that gives them light. When people come near you, they should see better. When people come near you, they should find solution. When people come near you, they should say, wow, I never know that this is the life of Christians. So beautiful, so wonderful. Say, taste and see that the Lord is good. When people come near you, we will make friends with you. You'll be able to say, oh, I never knew how I have been living in error for long. That must be the testimony of our lives. The same scripture is repeated in Luke eleven thirty three. 33. In church, you must let your light shine. At work, on the streets, amongst your friends, in public office. A lot of people want to go to public office. You know what? You must be ready to showcase that when you get there, you live a life different. As a wife, as a husband, as a pastor, let your light shine. As a businessman, in the home, in lockdown, let your light shine. Don't say, is this lockdown business? They said it's been affecting people's, people's psyche. It's been affecting people's mental problem. No, no, no. It's not your no mental problem. The Bible says in lockdown, what will you have? Sound mind. When you listen to that news, don't be thinking, oh, so that's why I've been snapping. Uh, that's why I've been snapping. My husband, don't please forgive me. It's just this lockdown. Lockdown is going to go away. Oh. If you allow bad seeds to rest upon you after lockdown, how will you get rid of it? How will you get rid of it? Everybody, now anywhere you go is Corona. They say Corona is outside. Corona is here. Corona is already going. Somebody wave, wave to Corona. Wave bye-bye to Corona. I don't have any Corona near me. Far from me. Don't anytime you see people trying to, you know, take a, the excuse of, you know, is Corona, is, they are trying to give you excuse. Because Corona, you say, I'm not there. <laughs> and I'm not there. I'm far away from you. Far away from you. When you were doing that thing, I was not there at all. So don't even lie that lie at all. <laughs> say with me, I will glow every day. <laughs> and I will glow everywhere. In Jesus' mighty name. I'll just end by mentioning these three things I shared with our leaders yesterday when we met. They're called the three pillars of success. And they will share the communion. Three pillars of success. I listened to a man share this message briefly, and I highlighted these three lines out of the message. I thought it would be good if we can leave this, we can have an understanding of these three pillars so that we can make impact. Number one, every child of God, everyone God created is a solution to an existing problem. You must have that understanding. Every person that God created, you are a solution or an answer to an existing problem. The problem has been there, but it now created you that through you, I will sort this problem out. This microphone was created by someone, manufactured. What was the problem that was existing? The problem existing is that when some people talk, you can only hear to an extent. But so, so that we can amplify their voice and everybody that speaks to hear better by so many more people, this was manufactured. The same way there are problems that God looked in everything that he made and he said, Tony Balogun, I'm going to use you to sort that problem out. You must have that understanding. The problem might be that the problem never finds the solution. And that will not be your portion. One of your prayers every day is that, God, what is the problem you created me for? I want to know that problem so I can sort it out. Because I'm on ground. Number two. Number two pillar of success. Is that you must attain mastery to solve the particular problem you were born to solve. 
you must attain mastery in it. A life of mediocrity can never give you success. Never. If we mentioned Microsoft today, who comes to mind? Yes, Bill Gates. If we mention free kicks in, well, there's so many people you can mention. Okay, if you mention Colonel Sanders. Sanders? No, you didn't get it right. You have to, you have to mention the right name. <laughs> who, who, would you, who would you say? KFC. Pardon? KFC. KFC. Okay, you, well, you talk about chicken, isn't it? But what, what I'm going to say is that there must be something that you are known for. If you mention Pelé, football, isn't it? If you mention Ronaldo, talk about dribbling. There are so many people that once you mention their name, they've developed mastery in that thing. That is how you must be, to be a solution. You say, bend it like Beckham, isn't it? Bend it like Beckham. When they were saying bend it like Beckham, Beckham said, before I could bend it, I was playing 500 free kicks every single day. 500. Until I was able to start bending it the way I should bend it. You, you just play 10. You say, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. What, are you, what have you done? What have you done that you're tired? You haven't even bent two. <laughs> Attain mastery. Learn how to do it. So that If they wake you up on, from the sleep, you can do it. Number three. And this is powerful. It says, no matter your location, when you bring solution to problems, you will be sought for. Wherever your location. If you start to get things right, anywhere you go, anywhere you are hidden, even if you are in the backside of the mountain, they'll come and look for you. People will come and look for you and pay for the fares. It will not matter how far you are. There is nobody that is mastery or that knows that have a solution that is left in obscurity. No. Nobody. Joseph so know how to dream and interpret dreams. That Pharaoh had a problem that they had to go and fetch him from the prison. Once you have a mastery, God will create problems where, you, where it matters for you. One day, King Saul just ran mad. Why? Because God wants to promote David. God needed David to be in the palace. And he was, in, he was still looking after sheep. So God said, okay, now that you are master of harp, I will just give a free gift to King Saul. <laughs> Let him just run mad. Just for a few minutes. He ran mad. Get the solution. The solution was that go and find somebody who could play harp. And as they will play the harp, God will bring calmness to the king. What a wonderful way. You don't need to be looking for somebody running mad. You just learn your harp. You see, what we do is that we want to orchestrate it. You see, they have said to you that this gift, this gift can make things happen. So you are looking for where to make it happen. Yours is not to look. They are coming to look for you. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. They are coming to look for you. That is a prophetic word for somebody. They are coming to look for you. Amen. You don't need to hurry yourself. Just stay where you are. The world is coming to your foot. These are the three pillars of success. If you're going to make success and make impact, learn to walk in them and God will honor you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Born to glow. Make up your mind. Make up your mind that you want to glow. What's that image? Josh, yeah, that's 
Look at it. I glow. I give light to our world. Let that be your desire. That everywhere and anywhere you go from today, I will glow. When there is darkness out there, make up your mind that I want to glow. I want to showcase the nature of God.